So can you tell us where we are right now? We are in the what they, we call the company booth at Milwaukee Rep. And when I look out the little window, you can see mm-hmm. the beginnings of our set and the theater in which we will be presenting in the Heights. Unlike other podcast interviews we've done, which were on site at 88.9, this is our first remote one. So we are in, in the Rep's turf right now. And then what were you just doing as of like four minutes ago? Four minutes ago. Um, and prior to that. Yes. Well, I was frantically catching up on uh, a couple of other deadlines that I have. Um, and uh, But before that, I was bouncing between music rehearsal as we're just in our first week of rehearsal at In the Heights. And we we're learning the opening number, the title number called In the Heights. And then I was also working through the choreography and the story with um, our choreographer, William Carlos Angulo. Very cool. So, and who are you? Hi. <laughs> yes. Uh, my name is May Adralis, and I'm the director of In the Heights. And I am also on full time staff at uh, Milwaukee Rep as the associate artistic director. All right. So, I'm very excited to be with you um, talking about. So, this is for the UPATH MKE Arts Live podcast. This is going to be a conversation that centers around In the Heights, which is an upcoming production that you're directing but we'll also kind of talk about some of the other pieces of context for it, which are both the city in which it's taking place, Milwaukee, and your career. I want to start by giving you a gift. So I'm reaching into my backpack because I know that you're on your dinner break. I was just at the Grand Avenue Mall, and I got, there's this great restaurant there named Funky Fresh Spring Rolls. What? So you can walk across the river to the Grand Avenue, and they make spring rolls that are really delicious. And they sell, this is actually, they just sell them for, it's Amanda's ginger beer and Amanda, so I have a pineapple and a regular ginger beer. I got one for you and one for me. Oh my gosh. And which do you choose, pineapple or ginger? Oh, I'll do the ginger. All right. So I know that, I met the woman who makes these, her name is not Amanda. I believe it is her grandmother. If I get this wrong, I'll I'll fact check it, but her grandmother's name is Amanda and Mm -hmm. is Jamaican. And this is kind of a back home recipe for nice ginger drinks so we're gonna start very good with some ginger drinks i used drinks. to live in the um in uh the west indies neighborhood in brooklyn so. which one prospect heights okay my sister lived in crown heights for a little while yeah that's part of it and she was there at the time when she moved in she was the only half asian person and half white person in her building and the only one who wasn't caribbean uh-huh. and when she moved away uh, there is a muffin shop on the you know, on the first floor, so it has it. I know that Crown Heights and a lot of New York is changing very quickly. Yeah, very and, very quickly. Okay, so I want to start with um, in the Heights. I will let you know because we just met a couple minutes ago. I am not um, an art aficionado. I'm aware of in the Heights. I'm aware of its uh, creator, as a lot of our country has been hip to him in the last few years. Uh, but can you tell me a little bit about the show in the Heights? Sure. Uh, the 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 creator is the very famous uh, and talented Le Manuel Miranda, um, and he grew up in the Heights. And this uh, musical is very much in style and content, an homage to the neighborhood. And what makes that neighborhood home, which is the people. Um, And he is writing for and about um, first generation and uh, and immigrants uh, that are in the Heights. I was reading a little bit about it. I actually have not seen In the Heights, and I'm definitely going to see it on this stage. It sounds like there's kind of a really... um, the, the characters that are in I'm like I'm looking forward to meeting them yeah. so I started reading about them and I was like oh I look forward to making your acquaintance can you talk a little bit about the the characters that are part of the play and, and the cast that you've been sure. working with I should say the first and foremost character which I just talked about the musical it, it's Washington Heights just to be specific because yep. there are a couple different heights in um, in in New York City um, and Washington Heights is uh, primarily like in the um, in the 70s, really enjoyed a, a large uh, Puerto Rican migration, and in the 80s, the Dominican Republic um, 
uh, migration, and uh, and so uh, the spirit and the the taste and the flavor and the energy mm-hmm. uh, is really generated from these two communities. It also is far north of Manhattan, and so it's just um, south of the where hip hop really mm-hmm. originated in the South Bronx. And our lead Ryan Alvarado and. Um, his his partner Alyssa Gomez, who's playing Carla in the show, um, they're both from the Bronx, and so mm-hmm. they can kind of speak to the the sort of vibe um, that um, in the musical brings. Um, but I mentioned the South Bronx because and hip hop because there's hip hop in the show. There's salsa and merengue. There's um, uh, reggaeton that is featured in the show, so mm-hmm. it's music and it's also dance styles that are infused in this. So that is the first character that you meet when you mm-hmm. go up to the Heights. You'll see it's uh, it is loud, mm-hmm. it is energetic, it is dense. There is just so much to look at and see and smell. And um, Lin Manuel Miranda, when he wrote this, he wanted to capture in this what in the musical what it was like to walk down Washington Heights, mm-hmm. a blocker. To. And so that is the fusion of all the music and the movement and the um, people calling to each other from, you know, stoop to stoop, from fire escape down to the street level. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that is the kind of um, that that is the kind of organized chaos that we want to create on stage. And um, so that is the first one we meet. And then what the heart of the story is, is this um, corner in Washington Heights in which it's most love and matriarch of the of this uh of this tribe is abuela claudia and she is um um very much the uh everybody's mother everybody's grandmother uh mm-hmm. looking out for everyone documenting um their uh, all of their major achievements and uh supporting them in every um and cheering them on Mm-hmm. Um, Usnavi runs a bodega where everybody, that's the kind of pulse of the place. Everyone comes in and out. Usnavi uh, is, um, you know, he his music really draws more on the hip hop. Um, and then there are the ladies of the salon that we call them that, uh, you know, they're the gossip of the, the heart. They're the sort of um, they're, they're the sort of feelers and the Paul Revere's of the, of sure. the society in which they're <laughs> telling everybody what's going on and who's getting it on with who. Um, and then Nina is uh, she is the daughter of the Rosarios who run a car service. Um, Kevin and Camila, who run this car service, are the parents of, of Nina. They are immigrants from Arecibo, Puerto Rico, and they um, have made something out of nothing to create this business and create a future for their daughter. And Nina is the first in her uh, family to ever go to college, and she's going to Stanford University. So that's just a little sampling sure, sure, of the sure. people. You know, it is usually um, the conversation of the origins of hip-hop might feel relatively remote to Milwaukee. Not that there isn't hip-hop but in Milwaukee. But it's Hip-Hop Week in Milwaukee. So it is Hip-Hop Week in Milwaukee. And very <laughs> specifically, so when you're listening to this, it won't be Hip-Hop Week. But tomorrow, on Friday, DJ Cool Herc is coming to Milwaukee. And DJ Cool, cool Herc, if you are kind of look at the mythology of the origins of hip-hop, he's like right up there in the pantheon. He, like oftentimes he's pointed to as like the guy who came 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 up with like the idea of hip hop in a lot of ways. So can you talk about um, the role that the idea of hip hop plays within the play? Uh, sure. Um, there are five elements of hip hop, um, knowledge, um, breaking, uh, break dancing, um, graffiti. I'm seeing. I'm seeing. And DJing, I think, DJing. Was, was the last one. Thank you. Yeah, no Thank problem. You. Um, and uh, all of those elements do find their way into uh, the musical in some way, shape, or form. They're not always by the same person, um, but certainly you can see it, um, its influence. And also, Lin Manuel Miranda's, um, you know, he cites like a lot of early 90s hip hop. Um, and hip hop artist to be, you know, his uh, some of the folks that he was looking to inspiration. Sure. So as we and we can kind of in the Heights will be in the same way that the Heights are part of a, a, a part of the cast of the play and kind of an ever present character. Um, I want to continue talking about in the Heights, but continue kind of turn the kaleidoscope of how we have the conversation. 
So we're sitting in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in the Rep Theater, and that's where this production is taking place. And, um, you know, as you were describing kind of the very dense and collision-rich uh, corner and the, the kind of street life that happens there, or life on the street, um, I drove here today. I actually bike often, but I drove here today. I parked across the street um, in front of City Hall and uh, across from, like, Milwaukee's most major theater complex. And in a, in a city like New York... That would be unfathomable. Mm-hmm. You'd need to like take a helicopter to get here, you know, as fast as it took me to to park here. And even then, too, I did. You know, Milwaukee is a very has a very automobile driven culture. You know, it has uh, people drive everywhere. We're kind of sprawled out in the region. Um, I did have a refreshingly uh, kind of a, a not a parallel to the kind of experience you just had. As I got out of my car, I saw coming um, walking across City Hall a friend of mine who is uh, does a lot of urban planning. And another friend of mine who was carrying, like, one of those rolls of paper, and, like, under his arm, another urban planner, and then the staff of the Milwaukee Public Library, some of the top brass from the Milwaukee Public Library system, came out. And I said, oh, I'm going across the streets to talk to the director of In the Heights. And they all said, oh, we, we're getting our tickets, or they already have their tickets. So I did think, even in that moment, even though there weren't, like, a thousand people swarming on the sidewalks, I had a very Milwaukee's version of mm-hmm. a collision-rich environment. Um that all said, I just wanted to transition our conversation into the into the um, general topic of doing this play in this city. So, can you talk about you know kind of as you as you're producing it? There's a you know there's a lot just to think about. But for yourself as the director, uh, what are some of the considerations you've made of bringing this play into specifically Milwaukee, Wisconsin in the year 2018? Sure. Um, I think what In the Heights is about is about community and the home that you make. So I think this experience you described of just seeing people that are about to have a shared experience Mm -hmm. is what you look for in a neighborhood. Not all neighborhoods are like that Mm -hmm. in New York, Um, but uh, Washington Heights certainly is. And so I think that um, anyone can find, um, they can see them themselves in uh, even if the world may seem um, different um, and very specific to New York City mm-hmm. um, the the relationship that you have with your neighbors that you're closest to the people that you see every day the people that where you happen to get your coffee in the morning mm-hmm. and uh, where you get your newspaper and that happens to be the same person every day that is the kind of neighborhood that uh, we were talking about and I think that translates to not just in America but all over the world mm-hmm. um, I think that everyone takes mm-hmm. pride in the, where they're from um, and and even in some way, whether it be sports or the kind of food or the you know, the people that they meet or the um, the architecture, um, and so I think that finding pride, which is some a, a journey that many people take, um, and reclaiming this as your home um, and having pride and that it's your home and trying to build that home up and build that community up is something that communities across the country share. So I think it's really special to bring it to Milwaukee. I think it will be transformative. I think that Milwaukee is a city that is growing and expanding and very um, exciting, yet very fast ways. And so um, to to have a musical that deals with the very issue of gentrification and um, how quickly a neighborhood can change and how you have to invest in your neighborhood in order to um, uh, to keep it home, mm-hmm. I, I think uh, will will uh, speak to a lot of issues that Milwaukeeans are facing now. Um, I also think that this is a dreamer's play. This is a um, this is a play for anybody that um, is first generation, uh, that is an immigrant themselves, or anybody that has ever felt outside and unwelcome in a mainstream society. Um, this is a this is a musical that really speaks to giving um, empowering those communities mm-hmm. um, and um, and. Sp- Inspiring them to um, take joy and celebrate the contribution that they're making mm. to their their home base. That is amazing. I'm so I'm so looking forward for this play being on stage here, and I hope that it is transformative. I will just say, and I don't I don't work for the rep. I don't need to kiss up, but I have noticed in the last few years. Um, oftentimes, you know, I'm, I'm a lifelong Milwaukee and I'm okay saying this out loud. I feel like the, 
the civic discourse here is too civil sometimes at the risk of being too polite. And a lot of times we don't take on and look head on to the biggest challenges that we have. And in part, because they can start to feel intractable, right? It can just feel like it's, it's this giant storm cloud that we have no influence over. So it can feel as if let's stop talking about that and look on the bright side. And I think one of the great gifts that the rep has been giving to the city of Milwaukee is being very intentional about um, choosing works of art, choosing works of theater that can be places where that can function as proxies for us to have some of these conversations that we may not have in full, you know, we, we can't always have that full discourse or we just choose not to have that full discourse. So I think, and you know, I, I've seen so many great, I'm not, I don't see every play the rep does, but I've seen some really great plays and it almost feels like, you know, this is an op-ed that should be in the Journal Sentinel. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it can kind of strike me that way. Um, so, so that wasn't really a question. I was just responding. I was just being yeah. a fan <laughs> for a second and happy. Um, well, I think the theater just, I, I think theater uh, has the capacity at, to really be an exchange of ideas and to be a, a safe platform to bring everybody um, to the same issue, to the same page, and discuss it. I think that because you're dealing with largely a work of fiction, mm-hmm. that um, you know that people can talk intelligibly and uh, without fear of um, of of real polarization or mm-hmm. offending anybody, because you are talking about a work of art that sure. mirrors life, um, but you're not talking about the thing itself. And right. I think somehow having that distance helps people t- take a step back and think more philosophically um, about the the change that the theater is proposing or that people witnessing it are proposing. Yeah. And I, you know, especially in Milwaukee, I'm going to kind of, how long have you lived here? Um, I guess I've been coming here as an right. artist since 2011. Okay. Um, and then lived here since last year. Okay. So you're, and also I should, I should, I don't think we mentioned specifically, you're this associate artistic director mm-hmm. of the Milwaukee Repertory Theater. Um, so I was, so I, apparently I generated all my ideas for this interview while I was parking my car. <laughs> as I'm parking my car, I was listening to, uh, I'm listening to Kendrick Lamar's Blacker the Berry which yeah. is from To Pimp a Butterfly. And as I was listening to it, like, whenever I listen to almost any kind of music, but specifically, like, Kendrick Lamar, for me, it's it's both what Kendrick Lamar is creating, but it ends up being kind of about where I am, right? Um, I think it's a very Milwaukee thing to do, is, is you know, sometimes our the, the social environment that we have here is is one that can be so challenging that it it almost feels like, you know, the art that makes critique on American social environment just feels like it's easy to transpose into our local environment. Last time I listened to that song, I was driving through Waukesha, and I rolled, that was my fiance, I rolled down the windows and we were listening to it very loudly. Um, not like to be a nuisance, but just to, you know. Because it feels good. Yeah, it felt good in that moment. It felt, so I think, um, can you talk a, a little bit about that being now a resident of, of Milwaukee and as like a person who making work here and you, you've already addressed that a little bit but but of you know how you you find this this work that you're producing here with your cast um how you find those kind like how you expect it to be received and how you found previous works that you produced in milwaukee received by milwaukeeans like um, i feel like we can yeah. always feel like i bet you think this song is about yeah. you kind of thing oh. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, in the at the very end of the day, I'm a fragile artist, so I like to think that everyone loves everything I put up on stage. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, You're sensitive about your shit. That's an Erica Badu thing. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, you spend, um, you know, uh, pretty much eight what eight months have been preparing for the show, so. Um, you invest a lot of your time and your energy and uh, to make it as good as it possibly can be. And so when you're dedicating that much time to one single project with the mm-hmm. team, um, of course you're going to be invested in it. And of course you want to have, um, feel like all of that work is paid off, you know. Um, 
I hope that within the Heights, I think the music is really infectious. I think that the um, I think that the lyrics are very poetic and thought provoking. I also think they're very funny, um, and so I don't think you can leave the show without having multiple numbers in your head, and that's that mm. is a gift of any. Mm. Uh, strong musical um not every musical has that sure. um but this one really does it's got a pop flavor and so it's not surprising to me when um someone who has never seen the show um still knows all the lyrics by heart because they've heard it from their friends or they've heard it on the radio or, or you know so um i think that the music is a universal language that is going to reach everybody mm-hmm. um and uh that is one thing uh the celebration of, of um, diversity, um, I hope that people will embrace. And the fact that salsa and merengue and the things that are influencing our popular culture and hip hop, mm-hmm. um, that they are now in the mainstream. And that's something that we uh, gained from the immigrant migration that mm-hmm. happened. Um, and so I think that um, all of that I, I want people to take away from. Mm-hmm. Um, I want, of course, like people, you know, we we are working very hard to have um, very nuanced performances from the actors. Um, we've just spent like the morning talking through their circumstances, talking through what made them them, what makes the community home, what are the aspects about Washington Heights that make it very specific. So we spend a lot of time on the details. I want people to have a bigger understanding of what it is to be... um, to be someone that struggles... um, in uh, with poverty and economic realities, I want them to really understand the circumstances that most people in this in this musical really struggle with the mm-hmm. debts and um, you know bills to pay and the the unsurmountable seemingly unsurmountable financial mm-hmm. obstacles that each one of them faces. In addition to the um, not just the economic disparity, but some of that is driven by the fact that of they're uh, they're part of a marginalized community. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I want people to be aware of that, sensitive to it, moved by those stories. Um, and, um, and, and you know, I want them to also be entertained. It's a very entertaining show. You can sit mm-hmm. back and that's what I mean. Like you can't leave without singing a song. You also can't sit through the show without moving your body. Sure. Um, you know, dance is incredibly important in this piece. It's one of the reasons I'm working. I'm so grateful to have William. Um, Carlos Angulo on the show with me because he uh, knows the soul of this show. He is this show, so he, um, uh, you when I'm when I'm uh, watching him and the dancers work, you can't help but move, and that's mm-hmm. what I want to. I want to see the whole audience vibrating. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I I spent a lot of time. Uh, sort of exploring the murky terrain of the media landscape in Milwaukee. And I think one of the products of our hyper-segregated region is a lot of times folks, it can be really hard to have access to the experience of community outside of your own. And I mean that across all lines, right? Mm -hmm. Like regardless of whether you're living in a predominantly white, predominantly black, predominantly brown community, it is oftentimes your your experience with, with other communities is very limited, um, and, and as I was hearing, like you, your, what you were, um, the process that you were bringing your cast through, and then what you're sharing with your audience is hopefully going to be sort of humanizing for communities for for folks. And actually, then there are folks from who will be able to identify it on a very identify with it on a very deep level. Can you talk about your own personal preparation for the play? And some of the, you mentioned it's an eight month process. Some of the things that you've done as a director, whether it's sort of been like research, I've gained an appreciation for how like research isn't always sitting and reading. Sometimes it's going somewhere and experiencing something and staying out till four in the morning if you need to. Uh, can you talk about some of the research that you've done sure. to, to make this, this uh, world that you're recreating yeah. on stage 
sure. even realer for you? Some of it is um, some of that I didn't have to research. Um, I lived in the Heights for a couple of years. Um, I also um, am a first generation. My parents are immigrants. Um, and so I was able to tap into aspects of the show. I also under I saw it very early on when it was at on the Off-Broadway Theater uh, when I was in New York. Um, and uh, and lived through some of the major events that actually is brought up in the play, which I won't I won't I won't spoil it for sure. you if you haven't seen. Um, and so some of that I can tap into just from lived experience. Yep. Um, I also know what it's like to be part of a marginalized community and also struggling uh, within that, both economically and also just um, uh, just in terms of opportunity and privilege. Um, but unfortunately, this is a podcast. <laughs> So you can't see. Great. Um, I, I like this. this spent is a lot of time in the Heights. Um, oh, cool. So here's my album of all the different places. So we're just looking at been. subways, bodegas. We're now looking down a row of brownstones. Yes, this is this classic. is one seventy second Street. Ooh. Some graffiti. The van that got tagged. Uh, yeah, this United, United Palace. Palace is actually. I think it was just bought. Mm-hmm. It's also um, this actually I, I I had to commend myself on the photograph on this because one of the things that uh, we are going to do is the the floor is actually has this crosswalk on it. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, some more graffiti. Um, the stoop. I took pictures of lots of different stoops, but this mm-hmm. actually happens to be the building I was in. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> um, we took a lot of costume research. That's, That's like certainly. one of the things that influenced. We're looking like, at Abuela. a woman. An, an older lady crossing the street with an incredible pattern, color, yellow zigzaggy jacket and a skirt that does not clash with it. it also has a strong pattern that kind of moves up into it. This is great. So, yeah. so you can see, um, you know, these are one yeah. of the characters in here. She registered people to vote when she was in high school. So these Got were it. young girls that I talked to that um, were registering people to vote awesome. on 180th Street. Um, I took a lot of pictures of people. You know, the thing about the Heights that's very it makes it a neighborhood is that everyone hangs out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so people, you know, sitting on crates or sitting on benches. All sure. these are. This is a picture of three older men who look like they do this every single day. Absolutely. Um, just sitting and shooting the shit. One thing I just want to point out: if you're at home, you she, these are photos from through different seasons. So we started in winter. Now, now it's very summery. Yes, yes. This is in August. Uh, so just recently. Yeah. This is just a couple couple weeks ago that you were. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. We're looking at delicious food. Uh, I shot from the hip on a lot of this. So, Absolutely. Uh, just trying to capture. This is my favorite picture actually because it's all these three old guys two sitting on some kind of like. Um, uh, makeshift bench and a crate and one of us walking by. You can't see it from across the street is another Piragua woman uh-huh. selling shaved ice. Wait, go back to it real quick. You know what's great too is, I don't know if that is there, but there's a sign behind them that says, who is America? <laughs> and it's these four older gentlemen just sitting. Oh, it's uh, Sasha Baron Cohen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so they're, they're, their question is, who is America? And there's four men Sitting in front of it as if they're That's right. offering an answer to it or making yeah. chiming in. Um, um, these are larger the buildings, so that when you see the set, it's very dense. We tried to really fill up the sort of uh, with these with volume of uh, these set pieces, and they're, they um, when you see it, you'll appreciate that it's. We didn't want we wanted to show the density of the city, um, but we also uh, wanted didn't want it to be so dark and gloomy. So they're actually scrim. They're actually light boxes, sure. which I'm excited about just directorially. So I have an idea of of just sort of to to share with you. I live on the near south side of Milwaukee, and I'm kind of all over the city. And you know, Milwaukee oftentimes is a city that's very color coordinated, very well sorted or segregated. The near south side of Milwaukee and the south side of Milwaukee is kind of the the shorthand that means people who come from Spanish-speaking countries, right? A lot of Mexico and increasingly Puerto Rico. Um, If there's a headline of the 2020 census, so when they do the new census, there will be for the first time in Milwaukee's history an influx of African-Americans moving to the south side into a predominantly Latino neighborhood. And that is kind of also the first time in Milwaukee's history where you have a t- predominantly brown neighborhood with a meaningful influence of black folks moving in. 
And I feel like that, I mean, specifically kind of the dynamic between black and brown and the cultures there is something that I know is part of In the Heights. And I think in some ways this is a conversation that people are having around Milwaukee, but in our largest civic dialogue that isn't something that's talked about a lot. There isn't a lot of discussion of kind of black and brown dynamics or unity or disunity. Um, so I think I'm, this will be an interesting platform for the kinds of the conversations that it could introduce in Milwaukee that we've kind of, like people are having, but not necessarily on yeah. large stages. I mean, I hope to, when you say color coordinated, I cringe because I think we look, we are, we are a society that has a uh, racist and a history of slavery. We have, um, we have divided and segregated people based on race and um, have, have allowed limited economic opportunity based on race. Um, and it's a th often thinly veiled mm -hmm. separation. And so I think what this show does is that it's not... It's not pitting one group of uh, under, you know, sure, and uh, like a, a marginalized people with another. Um, hopefully, it's showing the sameness rather than the difference mm -hmm. between not just people of color, but people of quote un not color, yeah. <laughs> and uh, allowing a kind of um, really. Um, uh, a celebration that this is not just a story about Latino people. This is not just a story about the people that are happen to be in that neighborhood that are black. This is a truly American story. I mean, mm. you know, when you talk about the 2020 census, we can also talk about the 2040 census in which most sure, sure. of America will be people of mixed race and of color. And that yeah. is what I'm after in terms of the work that I like to do, which is just shifting yeah. like what the American story is. Absolutely. Milwaukee and a lot of people, this isn't something, this isn't a headline on a daily basis, already is. The city of Milwaukee is majority people of color. That's right. I know, like and, 56%. Yeah, and it's kind of, it's not the narrative, right? Right, right, <laughs> It right. isn't what we think of. Um, so you said something in there, and you just gave me an idea, which is I'm going to invite my mother to the show, uh, Janet Lucar. She is a first generation immigrant, she's Chinese, and um, I think she'll find this really interesting. Sorry, if you're out there, mom, we're going to the show. Yes, please do <laughs> we'll go come. to the show. And I think- I wish my parents could see this because uh, this is the, you know, they, they, they try to see most of my work, but this is the show that I feel like they would love. It, so yeah. Do they live in Virginia? I was yeah. doing some- Yeah, yeah. They are do. they gonna come? Uh, they can. It's a little hard for them to travel. Yeah. They have been to Milwaukee, um, before, so they were able to, like, uh, you know, see a show that I did, and, um, I did, a, I directed a, sh a world premiere of, uh, Ray Pamatmans after all the terrible things I do. Mm. So his family, who is Filipino also, and, um, you know, came from Michigan, and my parents came from Virginia, so. Absolutely. <laughs> um, do you... Can you, so that's actually a good transition into the, the next topic that I wanted to talk about a little bit. So we've talked a little bit about the play, bringing that to Milwaukee, and then kind of you. So we can talk, can you share, and, and then I will ask you a big giant question that's a little unfair, but can you share a little bit about your context, um, specifically in terms of this play? So for yourself, some of your background and kind of what's prepared you to put in the Heights on a stage? Oh, yeah, uh, what's prepared me? Um, well, I, uh, um, you know, I, I mentioned before, you know, that I'm, uh, I have a particular interest in doing this show because of um, my own background as a first generation and my parents being immigrants. Um, and so uh, um, when I first saw this on, um, just in its first iteration off Broadway, I'd never seen anything actually that re remotely represented people that I knew growing up, mm -hmm. like you know my 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 aunts and uncles, my my tita and titos. I don't I didn't see them ever on stage. So this was a huge transformative event for me, um, and uh, it's it it fueled the need I think for stronger representation and more equitable representation, and that's really informed my artistic career. Um, and then just in terms of being an artist, um, uh, you know, I, I was started um, 
I grew up in a really teeny town in Virginia. I had an active Im- imagination. And then through a it was various... Was a rural town? It was a rural town. So it was an old coal of... and rail town. Wow. Yeah. Were there a lot of... I was um, actually going to ask, were there a lot... Was it very agrarian? Yeah. Yeah. My best friend owned a dairy farm. Wow. Um, and we used to four-wheel around her dairy farm, which was great. And then they, her father let me drive a car when I was 12. <laughs> You know, because that's what you can do on farms. I actually, so I recently had a very in-depth experience in Alabama, and a young man, Nasai, was telling me he's been driving since he was nine, <laughs> and I was like, "What?" And but where we were, it was a bunch of bunch of fields and open space, and I was, I guess, I guess that's what you do. I know. I guess that's what happens. Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was super rural, um, and uh, and so you know, you'd think like, oh well. Uh, you know, why would I find any affinity with the, this musical? But I moved to the, I had a big picture of um, uh, New York City by night on my wall that's still there. Um, mm-hmm. It was a big, huge poster that was, you know, I got at the mall. And uh, it's been uh, on my in my bedroom since I was like uh, nine years old. Uh. So I've always had ambitions to move to the city, um, and and I did. And um, though I didn't start theater until I was in later in my twenties, um, like uh, I, I went through a period of um, I wanted to I wanted to go into social justice, and it, that sort of informed my more political aspect of my life, um, but. Um, I decided theater is really where I belonged and where I wanted to focus my energy, and I, um, I uh, focused on that. And then I, I got my master's at Yale School of Drama, and then I came back to the city and I worked um, a lot in communities. I worked at the public theater when um, and did it was part of their community outreach efforts, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and then also simultaneously was directing and then working a lot with new plays. And so um, after another, uh, I, I worked at another organization that was focused on um, uh, launching new American plays into mm-hmm. the repertoire. Um, and so I developed really close relationships with a lot of writers. And then, then uh, you know, was directing all that while. And then uh, have been directing, freelancing for about the last 10 years around the country. Yeah, I was looking at some of the, and you have a long long career and have done impressive things and I I felt like a lot of the plays that you've been a part of have been really ambitious you know like a lot of very like cutting edge things and and challenging things like it seems like you've like kind of made your bread and butter on pushing the line or bringing new things into the world that like might be might there might not be a strong precedent for so yeah thanks I try to I feel like um, it's it does it is what kind of fuels me like I want to be able to do work that is uh, makes me grow as a person and mm-hmm. expands my own worldview and I will I will say this and I I just I'm so rooted in Milwaukee one th- I I know that I'm probably I grew up here I know that I'm probably going to live here for the rest of my life. And I, the, the city can feel very confining to people. I think it's specifically for black and brown folks, ambition can feel um, like a liability sometimes. Yes, I know that. And folks who yeah. are creative especially, um, success for them means step one is get away, mm-hmm. <laughs> get out. Step two is get a little bit further. Step three is come home for Christmas and then decide to never go back again. Yeah. Um, so I think, um, can you talk about that a little bit? So as a person who has a, an obviously a very ambitious, artistic intention with your life, um, what it's felt like bringing that and and making Milwaukee your home? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, I really relate to that a lot because I'm from a small town. And so, um, and actually, if you had ambition, um, it was really frowned upon. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it was as if because you wanted something more, um, uh, people felt slighted. And so I, I understand that, um, you know, where I, I do empathize and I understand where it's coming from, even mm. though if I've been frustrated by it sometimes in my mm. life. Um, it's really an exciting time to be at Milwaukee Rep. Um, you know, uh, I am relatively new to the company. You know, I'm often like I, I learn a lot from the subscribers here that have been coming here for years and years mm. um, about the history of uh, the theater and how beloved it is. Um, I've been really fortunate to be here with um, 
uh, Mark Clements, who I think has brought a really fresh and exciting artistic sensibility to the rep, and he is not afraid to bring on challenging work. Mm -hmm. Um, He really paved the way for me to do In the Heights. He started doing musicals here at the start of his tenure, and um, it's been a real success in opening the theater to different audiences. Um, I think this season in particular is um, just uh, astounding in its uh, diversity of style Mm -hmm. and the diversity of stories that we're telling. Um, You know, we're doing a mix of extant and and new plays, um, you know, in our Steamkey uh, our second space, uh, Brent Hazelton, who is an associate artistic director here and the director of new play development at the Rep, is directing uh, Rajiv Joseph's Guards of the Taj. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Joanna Marie Smith, who has been at the Rep before for American Song, she has written a new play called, um, a musical called Songs for Nobody. Um, and that's opening up our newly renovated Stackner. Um, we're doing Andrew Bavel's American premiere of Things I Know to Be True. Uh, we're doing the Midwest premiere of uh, I Had Actors Junk, and mm-hmm. um, I had just joined the board. And I'm just really proud and um, uh, excited for the work that um, you know the rep is doing and how it's really pushing boundaries. So I feel like it's a great place to be. And I'm also maybe your mom would want to come to this, but I'm doing a play called The Chinese Lady in the in uh, <laughs> I call the, her that sometimes. The Chinese Lady. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's about the first. Uh, it's about Afang Moi, who is a real person, but she's the first um, Chinese woman uh, immigrant on American soil, and mm, uh, she was actually wow. brought over by the Karn brothers, and then later. Her exhibit was sold to Barnum, so the she Karn was. Karn Brothers. Yes, yeah, so like she was C-A-R-N? actually. Yeah, C A R N E. So they were part. She was part of an exhibit. That is fascinating and disturbing. Disturbing. Wow. And it is. It's um. It's a contemporary play, yeah. you know. Um. And it really deals with um, you know, our curiosity. Uh, it, it it deals with. Uh, the sense of other and sure. um, globalism and sort of cultural appropriation mm-hmm. and um, you know uh, again like what what is the American story is her story also American and what is that yep. um, where, where does that where where can we go where how can we use that unknown piece of history and yep. learn a bit about ourselves absolutely I mean I think I found as being a biracial person growing up in Milwaukee and I know my mom has felt actually she came from LA where and her, she was part of a very yeah. thick and big Chinese community there that often was very like very hybridized with Mexican folks as well. But when she moved away from there, especially in Milwaukee, there wasn't really a context for her. Do you know what I mean? Like in Milwaukee, um, we still have a racial dialogue that's very black and white, literally, um, and is becoming more and more context for the Latinx community as well. But like being Asian in Milwaukee is still like wait, we have those here? You know, like that's, it's like not a, so that, I mean, so my mom I know has felt like the Asian lady (laughs) in a lot of contexts. Yeah, she's like the Chinese one. Yeah. And people don't, they're like, oh, okay. Like I I literally heard, and this was, I was in the Walgreens earlier today. I heard two um, women talking about, and she, one woman says the other, like, was he Chinese? And then the other one said, well, he looked a lot more Chinese than I do. And I thought, huh. (laughs) <laughs> like it wasn't a bad thing to say it was just it was such a weird yeah so I think like the context of Chineseness or Asianness generally in our yeah. art in Milwaukee is like it's also it's hard you know people want to put um, you know an identifier on everybody you know mm-hmm. like like who where do you identify I mean it's also been hard for I mean you know, my, my parents are both immigrated from the Philippines. And Philip, you know, I identify with being an Asian American. However, you know, the Philippines was colonized first by the Spanish for, mm-hmm. you know, around the same time that they were also colonizing Cuba. Sure. <laughs> um, and so, uh, um, you know, half of our, all of our food culture, Catholicism, you know, religion and uh, certain values and, our, you know, our language is 40% derived from Spanish or 40% Spanish. And so, um, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's an interesting in-between, you mm-hmm. know, um, 
and so uh, yeah, it's 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 a, it's, a, it's uh, talking about the gradations. Yeah, and yeah, race, yeah, yeah. and it, particularly in America, which is you know very much biracial and sure. mixed race, and um, it, you know people, you know class and uh, race, and all of these things don't always kind of align in the boxes that we right, right, think. Right. There's a mural on the south side on First and Mitchell Street. It uh, was installed about a year ago. It's the history of UMOS, United Migrant Opportunity Services in Milwaukee. And its first panel is depicts uh, folks working in a field. And it could be there. It could be in Mexico, could be in Wisconsin, could be in California. The next panel, there's some um, United Farm Workers flags that are hanging in one that has the, the slogan, I think it's... Uh, Isang Bagsa, which I think is Filipino, mm-hmm. and it was used in the fields, specifically the United Farm Workers Movement, which was both very Mexican and very Filipino. And that was kind of their solidarity statement. Oh, wow. I did not know that. I didn't know it until I gave a tour to some young people, and one of the young ladies on the tour was Filipina, and she she shared that with me. And I was like, that is very cool that in the fields of California, uh-huh. where a lot of this hardcore labor activism was happening in the 60s and 70s, there's this very strong tie between the Filipino and Mexican, and in fact, so much so that the their kind of rallying call was wasn't in Spanish. It was it was Filipino? Was oh really cool. wow! Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I just wanted to share that because like that's so interesting. And that is just a little piece. So that is just about everything I wanted to talk about. I know <laughs> that you are on your dinner break and. Yeah. You have a million things to think about, so I'm glad that you... I I just feel very grateful that you carved out some time to do this conversation. I will do my best to encourage everyone I know to go to the show. Yes, please. Through this medium and others. Um, Anything else you want to share? No, it's been a pleasure to get to know you. And, like, I don't know. Yeah, it'd be cool. Um, Yeah, it'd it'd be great to have the opportunity again. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks.